Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Anubhav Khandilwal, and I am a senior consultant in interventional radiology at Nidanta Hospital. And I want to thank uh, CCMA and ISVIR giving me this opportunity. My topic for today is ablation for parathyroid adenomas. So what are these parathyroid adenomas? They are the benign tumors of parathyroid gland, and they result in hypersecretion of parathyroid hormone. They are the most common cause for primary hyperparathyroids, and they constitute almost 85% of cases. Uh, let's uh, have a recap on the normal physiology of parathyroid gland and the parathyroid hormone, which is secreted by the parathyroid glands uh, in stimulation to the decreased uh, calcium levels in the blood. And this parathyroid hormone is basically meant to uh, have the homeostasis maintained of the calcium and phosphate levels in the blood. And it acts at uh, three organs. So it stimulates the osteoclastic activity at the bones, and which increases the resorption of calcium and increases the calcium levels in the blood. In the kidneys, it uh, decreases the excretion of calcium and increases the absorption of calcium, again leading to increase in calcium levels in the blood. And also in the kidneys, it acts on an enzyme, 1-alpha uh, hydroxylase, which is responsible for converting calcidiol to calcitriol, which is nothing but active vitamin D, and which helps in absorption of calcium, again leading to increase in the calcium levels in the blood. Uh, another role of active vitamin D is to initiate a negative feedback on the parathyroid gland to uh, stop the production of parathyroid hormone. And similarly, increased calcium levels in the blood also have a negative feedback on the parathyroid gland to uh, give it a signal to stop production of parathyroid hormone. Now, what happens when you have an adenoma? Adenoma is a benign tumor which leads to hypersecretion of parathyroid hormone. And what happens is that all the organs at which parathyroid gland is working uh, are hyperstimulated and you have increased levels of calcium in the blood. Uh, the only problem is that the negative feedback system is now ineffective because adenomas are autonomous and they are hyperfunctioning at this time. So what uh, happens is that you have increased uh, parathyroid hormone and you have high serum calcium and which leads to symptoms related to renal and skeletal system leading to nephrolithiasis and fragility fractures. Uh, about 33% of cases are also known to be asymptomatic. And this is usually in the initial stages when the parathyroid hormone is excessive, but the serum calcium uh, levels are not so high as to result in symptoms. And this is an interesting group because when we are discussing the treatment, it's basically these uh, patients who would, uh, who would, who would, uh, be uh, subjected to uh, the minimal invasive treatment. Uh, now, uh, the basic thing when we talk about treatment is to establish the diagnosis. And the diagnosis is uh, basically established by two main modalities. And one is uh, the ultrasound, and the second is uh, the system EV scan. On ultrasound, the parathyroid gland adenomas usually are uh, hypoechoic, and uh, they have increased vascularity, and you can most of the times track a vessel leading into the parathyroid gland on Doppler ultrasound. On system EV scan, there is a sustained retention of system, uh, technetium in the delayed images, uh, suggesting an adenoma in the parathyroid gland. Uh, manage, when we talk about management, uh, the main management for parathyroid adenomas is surgical, and parathyroidectomy for primary parathyroidism is curative in about 95% cases. Uh, there are certain group of patients who are not fit for surgery or patients who are not willing to undergo surgery or asymptomatic patients who do not want to get a medical treatment done, uh, who do not want to get a treatment, done, a surgical treatment done, are subjected to medical treatment by using calcium mimetics. The problem with calcium mimetics is that uh, the calcium mimetics are uh, not effective in long term. 
uh, they are less well tolerated by the patients and uh, also uh, there is uh, a lot of GI related uh, side effects which make patient uh, non-compliant to using these calcium imatic drugs. Uh, we also talk about asymptomatic patients to receive treatment because in the long run, we know that these patients would land up with uh, problems related to hypercalcemia. And that's why all these asymptomatic patients in the initial phases are uh, advised to get a treatment done. Minimal invasive treatment options are basically aimed uh, to treat patients who cannot undergo surgical treatment and have been used uh, for last 20 years uh, in these group of patients. Uh, the main minimal invasive treatment options are ethanol ablation, laser ablation, microwave ablation, and radiofrequency ablation. And uh, the basic advantage with these minimal invasive treatment is that they overcome the issues with surgical treatment. That is, they do not require general anesthesia, which may be a problem for patients who are at high risk. It can be done bedside uh, and it's advantageous in patients who are critically ill and cannot be taken to OT. There is no risk for post-treatment hypoparathyroidism, uh, which most of the patients are scared of and are not willing to get surgical treatment done. And obviously, uh, they have minimum morbidity related to the procedure. Uh, so let's uh, look uh, at the published literature in the next couple of slides. Uh, so, uh, which uh, are basically on these minimal invasive techniques. If you look at ethanol ablation, though uh, we have a small number of studies, but uh, it is one of the first developed uh, ablation technique. It was developed in 1980s by Italians for secondary for treatment of secondary hyperparathyroidism. And however, there are no large series on the use of ethanol for parathyroid adenomas. Um, and uh, uh, but it has been extensively used in uh, parathyroid cyst and secondary hyperparathyroidism. The uh, though although the uh, ethanol ablation can easily be performed uh, and causes uh, tumor necrosis and shrinkage, uh, its use in parathyroid adenomas is limited by several um, disadvantages, including the non-uniform distribution uh, within a solid lesion, uh, resulting in uh, inadequate uh, ablation, and also there's risk for extravasation of the ethanol, uh, which may result in damage of rectal laryngeal nerve, and also cause perilesional fibrosis, which may be which may cause difficulty in subsequent surgical dissection if at all it is required. Uh, coming to laser ablation, uh, again only small number of case studies have been assessed uh, uh, for treatment of adenomas using laser ablation. And um, uh, uh, Professor um, uh, Tiana and Jiang is here with us today, and uh, uh, he has his studies, uh, which has uh, 21 cases, which has been published uh, for treatment of uh, parathyroid adenomas. Probably he'll be able to uh, throw some more light on the, uh, the effects of laser ablation in the QA session. And um, he, so he had reported his clinical success up to 81% at uh, 12 months follow-up with patients who were treated for this um, parathyroid adenoma with laser ablation. Uh, so microwave and radiofrequency ablation have been used recently uh, in most of the um, centers where the ablation had been done for these adenomas. And uh, if we look at uh, the published data, uh, probably microwave ablation has more number of cases uh, uh, than uh, the radiofrequency ablation. And also the, uh, the follow-up period is much longer with uh, microwave ablation. However, if we look at this recent study, which uh, uh, was published this year in April 2021, it's a retrospective analysis of um, thermal ablation combining the results from the microwave ablation as well as uh, the radiofrequency ablation. And the study comes from the cases done at four centers. Uh, these, uh, uh, the study uh, showed the ablation results in patients, 119 patients for whom microwave ablation was subjected to 96 patients and 23 were subjected to radiofrequency ablation. The median follow-up was 18 months 
and the technical success rate was 98.3%, while the cure rate was 89.9%, and which was maintained above 80% to 18 months. Uh, if we compare uh, with the outcomes of radio frequency ablation and microwave ablation in the same uh, study, then we'll find that there was no difference in the cure rates at six months. Uh, uh, and also the incidence of complication in microwave group and the RFA group were comparable. Uh, another interesting thing which came out from this study was that if we look at the with lesions which were less than uh, six millimeters, and this 95% result is almost comparable to that of surgical resection. Uh, now talking about our experience at our center, we've done um, radio frequency ablation for 10 patients and our work was published uh, earlier this year. And we had these 10 patients who had uh, various comorbidities for which uh, the surgical treatment was not possible for these patients. And uh, we used 18 or 19 gauge uh, the ablation approach was either a transparatal approach to these lesions or a direct approach when the lesion was uh, large. And uh, as we have seen in the lectures uh, today, um, the, the technique which was used was moving shot technique. Um, Dr. Ajit had showed it uh, nicely in thyroid nodules. So this is no different. It's the same way with RFA as it is with microwave ablation try to move the electrode and cover the uh, nodule with the epigenic cloud. So the technical endpoint of the ablation was when the entire nodule was covered with the ecogenic cloud. And also uh, on color Doppler, there was no color pickup within the nodule. Uh, so in some of the patients, we had to do hydrodissection because the nodules were large and were abetting the uh, major vessels. So in order to avoid heat sink effect, we had to separate the nodules with the vessels and we used 5% dextrose to do that. Safe targeting and complete ablation of the parathyroid adenomas was achieved in all 10 patients. Serum calcium check was done 72 hours later and the parathyroid hormone was checked after seven days. Uh, mean serum calcium levels uh, came to normal after uh, 72 hours in all our patients. If we look at the follow-up, then uh, we will find that uh, at one month, uh, we had two patients falling out of uh, uh, the follow-up period and one patient died of um, uh, cause uh, unrelated to the ablation. So um, seven patients had uh, normal calcemia after one month. And uh, at six months, again, we had... Uh, one more patient who uh, dropped out of uh, the follow-up and we had uh, five patients who had normal calcium levels. So I would like to conclude by saying that ablated technique like microwave and radio frequency ablation for parathyroid adenomas are safe and effective treatment method for symptomatic patients who are not fit for surgical treatment and also for asymptomatic cases who are not willing to undergo surgery, especially patients who are less than 50 years old, because surgery is mostly offered for these patients. And for more than 50 years old, when surgery is not usually done and patients are kept on uh, surveillance, even in that interim period, uh, minimal invasive thermal ablation can be offered to these patients to get the best results. Thank you.